Thank you all. It is a wonderful turnout. I appreciate everybody coming out tonight. This is the second in what's going to be a series of lectures on ending chronic pain. Um, we have a very uh, different concept of what pain is and what depression is. Uh, and that's evolved out of the research, uh, particularly in the last five years. And so we have a completely different way of approaching these problems. And we think of pain and, um, and depression as two very different things, when in fact they're not all that different. And the concept is that pain and depression, anxiety, post-traumatic <coughs> stress syndrome, are symptoms. Okay, this is a very different way of thinking. We think of depression as a thing. We think of pain as a thing. We talk about fibromyalgia. We talk about neuropathic pain. All right? But really what they are is nothing more than symptoms of an underlying common neurologic process, which is a neuroinflammatory process in the central nervous system. So chronic pain and depression, anxiety, is caused by an inflammation in the brain. These issues are neuroinflammatory. They are neurodysregulatory. They screw up the way the brain works. And most importantly of all, they are neurodegenerative. Okay? Things get worse the longer they stay in the system. All right? And the reason we started to think about this is because if you look at the chronic pain population and you look at the depression population, what you find is there's a massive overlay. That in fact, the overwhelming majority of people who have chronic pain have depression the overwhelming majority of people who have depression of chronic pain. And the reason for that is this underlying neuroinflammatory process. And this is just to tell you that we know this because there are these inflammatory markers in the central nervous system that we're actually able to measure. Unfortunately, we can't measure them in the peripheral blood uh, because of contamination from uh, peripheral factors. But if we want to follow them, we can do spinal taps, which we're not doing, but have been done repeatedly over many, many studies in the literature. And increasingly, we're all coming around, we as in the medical profession, to understanding that these are neuroinflammatory diseases. This is the most important thing. If you look at these studies in long term in people with uh, chronic depression and chronic pain problems, you see loss of gray matter. The brain deteriorates. Over time, these things get worse, and they hit a point where there's not much we can do about it. I love working with my 20-year-olds and my teenagers because their tissue is so resilient that pretty much we can expect to see full recovery in these individuals. It is not as successful in our 60-year-olds and 7-year-olds. Right? We can certainly make improvements, but the sooner we get to this stuff, the better off the odds are that we're actually going to be able to get a full recovery. So we're just re-emphasizing this again, inflammation, dysregulation, and degeneration, chronic pain. Now, Everybody wants the pill, and I wish I had one to give you to make it all go away, but I don't. What I do have is a process, and tonight, specifically, the process we're going to talk about has to do with nutrition and how we process the foods we eat. So, specifically, what we're going to talk about is metabolic syndrome, obesity, intestinal permeability, and I'll explain what that is uh, as we go through it, celiac disease and gluten sensitivity, and then we'll give a quick overview and a somewhat shocking overview in terms of how severe the vitamin and mineral deficiencies are in the general American population. So let's talk first about metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is a combination of these things. So you have three or more of these things together, you have what we call metabolic syndrome. So if you've got a large waistline, men greater than 40 inches, women greater than 35. If your triglycerides measured on blood work are greater than 150. If you're high density lipoproteins, which is part of that lipid profile. So the LDL, the low density lipoproteins, are the things that we really want to watch come down. But the HDLs, okay, this is part of the cholesterol profile. The HDLs, high density lipoproteins, are the brooms of the cell. They're the things that help remove the cholesterol uh, from the arteries. Hypertension, obviously a clear risk factor across the board. And then glucose intolerance. That is a fasting glucose greater than 100. What this implies is that if you've got lots of uh, sugar spikes going on in your body, you have insulin spikes that go with them, and that's an inflammatory condition in the body. So you get three out of five of those, and you have metabolic syndrome. If you're going to measure your waist, your waist is actually not here. These are your hips. Your waist is, you feel where the lowest ribs are, halfway between the two of those, which really puts you close to your belly button. 
and you take the measurement around there, that's your waistline. And that's legitimately what you're measuring uh, when you want to figure out whether or not you have metabolic syndrome. So, how many people have metabolic syndrome? Lots. Over 20% of Americans of all ages, and if you're over age 60, over 40% of people have metabolic syndrome. It's a very, very serious and prevalent problem in the country. The causes are unquestionably diet, okay? Diet and lifestyle. Sedentary lifestyle and eating most of the foods that we have no business eating. Genetics certainly plays a role in this. And a thing called sleep apnea. How many here are familiar with sleep apnea? You're my patients, you better all be familiar with sleep apnea. because I. All right, sleep apnea affects about 5% of the population. And what it amounts to is the most common form of it is obstructive sleep apnea. You stop breathing at night. So if you're snoring heavily, you may have obstructive sleep apnea. If you find yourself sleepy during the day, not refreshed after sleeping, you may have obstructive sleep apnea. Now, now daytime sleepiness and, uh, and difficulty uh, staying awake during the day is not always because of sleep apnea, but it's one of the things that needs to be checked. And it's so easy to screen for that it should be part of every single physical exam. This is an Epworth scale. It's a very easy, quick two-minute screen in terms of what do you do. So do you get doze off? Do you get slight chance, moderate, or high chance of dozing off under any of these circumstances? And if the answer to that is yes, so that the points add up to over 10, then you need to be considered for a possibility of having sleep apnea. All right? Sleep apnea, people think of sleep apnea in large, obese individuals. All right? And yes, they are at greater risk in terms of sleep apnea. However, if your neckline is greater than 16 and a half inches, if you have a somewhat recessed jaw, these all put you at risk for sleep apnea. So you don't have to be overweight to have sleep apnea. You can, in fact, be slender. And it can be a very, very serious problem. So serious, in fact, that if we have sleep apnea and it's untreated, we're talking about a potential decrease in lifespan of up to nine years. Increased risk for stroke, increased risk for hypertension, and metabolic syndrome is part of the problem. Sleep apnea is an inflammatory condition, as is metabolic syndrome. So just something that you want to think about. What we see in metabolic syndrome, and the reason we're talking about it here, is because it's an inflammatory state in the body. So these same markers that I mentioned earlier that we have all seen now in chronic pain and chronic depression patients, we're seeing in metabolic syndrome. So metabolic syndrome is an inflammatory state in the body. And what do we see increased risk for with metabolic syndrome? Well, type 2 diabetes, non-insulin dependent type, heart disease, stroke. But what about pain and depression? Because that really hasn't been discussed a lot in, in the literature. Uh, as far as metabolic syndrome being a risk factor? Well, the answer is, it is a risk factor. So in women with fibromyalgia, they were 5.56 times more likely to have metabolic syndrome than controls. Chronic neck pain, the relative risk is 2.1 in males and 1.5 in women if you have metabolic syndrome. 50% greater occurrence of depression if you have metabolic syndrome. So we see both a clinical correlation in the occurrence of metabolic syndrome, pain, and depression, as well as we see the inflammatory markers going up. So the presence of metabolic syndrome is a problem. How do you get rid of it? You need to lose weight. Basically, you lose 10% of your present weight, and that will flip over most of your metabolism, so that it will decrease your risk. Aerobic exercise, 30 to 60 minutes a day. Walking five miles a day will also be effective for you. And you can go online if you've got an iPhone or, and they can download an app called Pedometer. It's free. You turn that on and it'll clock how far you're walking every single day. And that which is measured changes. So it is worth getting that app, cost you nothing, and start measuring what you're doing. Uh, Anti-inflammatory diet, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit later. Plant sterols, uh, two to two and a half grams a day. Uh, green tea, uh, about two cups a day, three cups a day. And you can get decaffeinated green tea, which can be uh, very healthy and effective for you. And the good news is dark chocolate. But it's got to be the good stuff. You got to be doing 72% or better uh, a cocoa con concentration in it. And about an ounce and a half a day, not a pound. <laughs> You don't get to have the entire, you know, in America we get these chocolate bars that are this big and it's like a serving. It's not a serving. <laughs> it's several servings. 
So an ounce and a half of dark chocolate a day actually helps lower blood pressure, actually softens the artery so that they're not as stiff, they're more compliant, and that less risk for stroke and less risk for heart disease as a result. It'll also improve your mood a little bit. You get a little bit of endorphin boost out of it. So an uh, ounce and a half a day of dark chocolate. Other treatments, oral magnesium supplementation lowers fasting glucose and lowers high-density lipoproteins. Uh, doses up to 360 milligrams per day or to bile tolerance. So what happens with um, magnesium is you can get diarrhea, right? Phillips Milk and Mag for those who have constipation. So what you want to do is start slow and gradually work it up. There are different forms as magnesium citrate and magnesium glycinate, which tend to be better absorbed than some of the other forms of magnesium. And so uh, starting at 120 milligrams a day and gradually increasing it every couple of days as long as your stools aren't getting more frequent and loose. If they are, then you need to back off. Omega-3 fatty acids and flaxseed oil, somewhere between a gram and a half to three grams a day. There is some controversy about mag uh, omega-3s. There's a suggestion that it may have an increased risk for prostate cancer uh, in, in males. I think it's still debatable, and I think the risk versus the benefits far outweigh the risk. And so I'm still encouraging people to be taking about a gram and a half and again, depends on the condition. I may go up to six grams a day of omega-3s. Flaxseed oil also has um, omega-6s in it. Uh, in addition to the omega-3s, it turns out that we need some of the omega-3s. Uh, so combining those two is probably the best route to be going as opposed to just one. Aloe vera supplements, there's, they're not yet on the market. This is very recent research. But there's this extract of the plant leaf in aloe vera that will be on the market probably in another year that has been shown to be very effective in uh, improving glucose tolerance uh, and lowering insulin resistance. Uh, so that will be coming. The studies are pretty strong on that. And then high fiber diet. Obesity. Obesity and being overweight. Okay, so we've looked at metabolic syndrome, clearly an inflammatory state, clearly associated with depression, clearly associated with pain. Obesity. Obesity is a body mass index of greater than 25 kilograms per meter square. Uh, this is overweight, rather, I'm sorry. You can <coughs> calculate your BMI by, there's a bunch of websites that you go to, just put in BMI calculator and add in the numbers, which you need to do, which is uh, your height and your weight, and it will calculate out uh, what your BMI is. Uh, obesity is BMI is greater than 30 kilograms per meter squared. 65% of all adults are either overweight or obese in the United States. This is the new norm, and it ain't normal. We have a problem. Overweight and obese individuals have a significantly higher percentage of back pain, chronic headache, migraine, and tension headache, osteoarthritis, fibromyalgia, and abdominal pain. This is because being overweight and obese are inflammatory states. As far as depression is concerned, again, you see 55% increased risk of developing depression for individuals who are obese and you see a 58% increased risk of becoming obese in individuals who are depressed. Reciprocal relationships in these things. Obesity, overweight are risk factors for depression and pain, and they are inflammatory states. The largest endocrine gland in the body is fat. Okay, endocrine is a gland that produces a substance that has an action elsewhere. Thyroid gland produces thyroid hormone that acts throughout the entire body. Fat actually is an endocrine gland. It produces a variety of substances, most of them inflammatory, that have actions elsewhere in the body, also in the central nervous system. So all of these factors are signaling molecules that set off inflammatory actions in the body. And the main issue, of course, is overconsumption of food and the types of food we eat. When we talk about inflammation, when we talk about inflammation, everybody gets very confused. Because what is inflammation? Inflammation is a lot of different things in the human body, and it does a lot of different things. So if you have allergies to ragweed, and you have teary eyes, and you have a runny nose, that's inflammation. All right? The mucosal membranes are inflamed, they're irritated. The cause of it is a release of histamine by, as a result of contact with things that you're allergic to, the ragweed. The treatment for it is get, rid of, get yourself out of the, uh, the exposure to the ragweed, but also antihistamine. Now, aspirin is a lovely anti-inflammatory, right? Would you take aspirin to take care of an allergic reaction? No, because it's a different type 
of inflammation that it's treating. And it's a different type of inflammation in the body. If you get a cut and the cut gets infected and the skin is superficially infected, all right, that's an inflammatory reaction in the body. That's mediated by white cells in the body. And you would treat that with an antibiotic, which would not be effective for treating hay fever. The type of inflammation we're talking about here is an inflammatory response that occurs in the central nervous system. It's not completely unique to the central nervous system. It has communications with the peripheral inflammatory factors, but it is different than the inflammation of, say, allergies or, say, an infection. Okay, does that make sense? Because it's very important we get this distinction because every type of inflammation in the body needs to be treated differently. Can't treat them all the same. But in the case of the inflammation that occurs in the central nervous system that leads to depression, that leads to sleep disturbances, that leads to generalized pain syndromes, these can be directly linked back to our diet. These can be directly linked back to obesity, being overweight, and having metabolic syndrome. So our lifestyles, our diets, have a very significant impact about inflammation that goes on in the central nervous system. And there are very severe consequences. Excess sugar in the body and excess free fatty acids become inflammatory uh, in the system. And it's a result of over re uh, activation of reactive oxygen species, ROS. So if we look at what is an inflammatory diet? Well, actually, the standard American diet is an inflammatory diet. And this is the problem. Gluten in any and all forms. All right? Pretty much, we almost got this pyramid right if we had simply gotten rid of the bottom part of it. So if that's more your diet, you're actually pretty much on an anti-inflammatory diet. And there are a number of different diets which people have devised, the Mediterranean diet, the Okinawa diet, the Paleo diet, all of which help reduce inflammation in the body. Because what they do is they give you your foods, your proteins, that you need to break down in your system in such a way that they don't break down very fast, which refined carbohydrates do, all of our breads, and thus they don't cause that insulin spike, which leads to that very complicated table I was talking about, what reactive oxygen species and accelerated death of uh, mitochondria, which are the, the energy uh, engines of the cell. So moving to these kinds of diet, and a paleo diet is basically, um, if it occurs naturally in nature, you're allowed to eat it. So next time you see a croissant tree, you're free to have a croissant. Until you see the croissant tree, you can't have one. And one of the problems that's happened with our grains and why we've become, grains have become such a problem for us is our refining process. So it used to be that we ground wheat with a stone. And that was relatively inefficient. We now grind them with these ceramic grinders, and we create this really fine powder, uh, the end result of which is it moves into our system faster, gets digested much faster, okay, and it causes the sugar spike and thus an insulin spike. So the grains, we have way, way, way too many grains on our diet, and we need to cut way back on them. 